Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, this is Joel, and in this video, we will start looking into um, another interesting technology, which is Cisco TrustSec, right? Um, and we'll look into how we can kind of configure it uh, in a simple network with our eyes and so on, right? Uh, just like any other of our uh, videos, what we'll do is we'll uh, spend a few minutes understanding the technology, and then we'll look into uh, the configurations corresponding to it, okay? Now, TrustSec is actually a very, um, it's not something which probably I can cover uh, in few minutes, so I'll try to uh, be brief as much as possible because um, else the video is probably going to be too big. It's a big topic, but I would advise you to uh, check out some of the guides to uh, understand uh, the technology, to, uh, to look at certain config guides, you know, to understand the technology better, right? That being said, let's start with the uh, discussion. So, before we even start understanding TrustSec, right, we need to understand the why behind it. Why do we want TrustSec? If you look at the current uh, scheme of things, when you talk about, um, you know, access control, right, what do we have? We have VLANs, right, we all of us know what VLAN does. We also have ACLs, you know, our good old ACLs. We have been using it for like decades now, right, so ACLs, the layer 3 ACLs. And you can also consider the DACLs, the downloadable ACLs which you get, you know, along with your ICE sessions, right? So probably you can consider those as well. So all of these are various ways of, um, you know, deploying access or doing access control in your network. Now all of these guys have one limitation, which is as your network grows, the complexity involved with these guys, you know, increase. With VLANs, we already know, right, uh, you already have an upper limit on number of VLANs, so you can't cross that, right, so as your network becomes big, you will not be able to use this. Um, and uh, uh, the, with respect to ACLs, uh, because in ACLs, the access control is predominantly built based on IP addresses, so what happens is the number of ACs needed to implement access control in your network is becomes big as your network increases. DACL also, the problem is that uh, uh, DACL kind of uh, helps in one way to reduce the number of ACs because, um, you know, uh, before that I've been referring to the word ACE. So ACE is nothing but, you have ACL and under ACL you define your permit and deny statements, right? Those are nothing but your AC, right? So just to, just for your reference, uh, access control entries, that's it. So coming back to DACL, DACL, the difference between DACL and a normal ACL is that, uh, DACL is generally uh, you know, deployed at ingress, right? It's an ingress enforcement um, uh, generally after a successful authentication. So, uh, which means it's always going to have one single source, right? So, you are basically, uh, instead, of, instead of having huge amount of uh, ACLs on every single switch, now you can have just source specific, you know, ACLs on that switch. So, it kind of reduces your number of ACs. But then, um, you know, as your network becomes big, your destinations are going to be big, right? So, uh, or you're going to have a big set of destinations. So, in that case, uh, DACL also uh, is going to hit a limit because all of the ACLs are generally stored in TCAM, right? And TCAM memory is kind of very costly or very limited. So, you can't like stuff whatever you want over there. Uh, and it, if you do that, your uh, memory would soon, you know, hit the threshold and you would, your device would go for a toss. Right, so there is, um, uh, let's say, limitations. There are limitations while using the existing set of, uh, you know, access mechanisms, right? So now this is where our, uh, you know, uh, uh, trust set comes into play, right? So let's take an example, an actual example to understand this, right? So let's imagine uh, you, in your traditional network, so in a traditional network, let's say, we have a bunch of, bunch of source and destination, right? So source, let's say we have, uh, uh, you know, this is a enterprise, right? So we're gonna have some managers, let's assume we have managers. We have, uh, let's say, uh, two different managers, two different managers belonging to uh, 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 two different, you know, org inside of, you know, enterprise, right? So S1 and S2. Uh, think of uh, your HR, right? Uh, HR people using their systems probably, let's tag them as, or let's call them as S3, and your IT folks using their computers and that's gonna be S4. On the destination side, let's assume we have uh, sales, we have uh, 
again HR again maybe finance and each of these guys are gonna have like say D1, D2, D3, D4 and D5, D6 just you know I'm just uh, let's say these are six different servers right now in your traditional network what happens as you go on defining your ACLs right so um, let's let's try to calculate the number of ACLs needed right in such a scenario right so um, let's take uh, for example for S1 right for this one single guy for one single source um, you would want to define um, uh, the permissions or relationship between uh, S1 with each of these uh, destinations which is going from D1 to D6 right so the number of uh, ACEs needed for this would be um, you know S1 so that's just one single source multiplied by six destinations and let's say for every of this uh, you know uh, uh, destination you want to define like four permissions right when I say permissions they could be like permit uh, you know DNS deny DHCP permit uh, ICMP something like that right so they could be like uh, permissions right so you can have different permissions but to keep uh, uh, to make our calculations easy let's assume that S1 has uh, uh, I mean from S1 you want to define four permissions to every of these destinations so 1 into 6 into 4 you're gonna get 24 ACEs right and that's just for one single guy which is S1 multiplied for all the four guys it's gonna be 96 right ACEs so 96 ACEs right access control entries would be needed to realize the access control for four of these sources and six of the destinations with four permissions per you know connection or per uh, uh, you know per path let's say now let's try to see uh, or let's try to kind of analyze the same scenario uh, in case of what would happen if we do using plus sec right let me just get uh, let me just reduce the size of this a bit okay so that's good so the same scenario what I'll do now is I'll um, or let's actually make this number even bigger right uh, what I mean by bigger is let's kind of increase this to say 400 you have 400 uh, systems right on the source side and let's say you have uh, not just six rather you have six, 30 30 destinations right so going back our, to our calculations it's going to be 400 multiplied by uh, 30 multiplied by four uh, permissions per connection so you're gonna have 12 four, three, four multiplied by 3 12 12 you're gonna have I believe uh, 48,000 so you're gonna have 48,000 ACEs right when you talk about 400 servers or 400 source and for 30 destinations right that's huge now how TrustSec or SGT really helps here is that the same thing can be realized in a very simpler way so <clears throat> so you have four different sources right so what in std or in uh, security groups what we do is we assign tax right just numerical tax so what we do is we assign tax so you have s1 you have s2 s3 and s4 so we assign tag here we say tag let's say number 10 this is going to be number 20 this is 30 and this is 40 so we have four tags given to each of the sources on the destination though we have um, um, you know though we have uh, uh, or let's say even over here right uh, though we have 400 uh, you know uh, systems 400 laptops or so 400 PCs these 400 PCs are gonna be part of one of these four guys right it's either gonna be s1 or s2 s3 s4 so it's either gonna be a PC belonging to managers um, you know uh, that is s1 and s2 or it's going to be either belonging to hr or it's either going to be belonging to it right so this 400 pcs are now kind of condensed into just four tags on the destination side right on the destination side we have like i said forget the six we increased it to 30 we have 30 destination servers but all these 30 destination servers are going to be again tagged back to right one of these three guys which is sales so sales let's give a tag 50 hr let's give a tag 60 and finance let's give a tag 70 right so even though you have 30 servers here they're going to be part of one of these guys right 
So now, look at the number of permissions needed. So in, in secure, in um, you know, scalable groups or secure group tags, what we do is first you, you, you break your whole network or you, you group your whole network clients, right, mainly into different groups. In our case, we have done that. We have grouped it into S1, S2, S3, S4 on the source side. And, um, you know, we have done it into, you know, sales, HR and finance on the destination side. Once you do this, now you can define your ACL, right? In, in secure or in TrustSec, we basically call them as SGACLs, right? So now the number of ACLs are going to be just four because you have four here multiplied by three because you have three and then go ahead, you know, define four permissions, right? Four into three into four. So that's going to be 48. Look at the drastic reduction, right? So we took our whole network, right? Where we had, uh, you know, 400 clients, 30 servers, right? Sources and destinations and four permissions per uh, flow. And what we did was we had 48,000 ACs. We kind of reduced that to just 48 ACs, right? Now look at how much amount of TCAM memory you're saving because of this, right? So that's the power of, you know, uh, using TrustSec. All right, now that you know the why part, let me just grab my ball here and get rid of this. Probably let me just create a new page. <clears throat> right, okay, so now that you know, um, now that you know the idea behind why we gotta use this, let's talk about uh, certain terminologies, right? So, you already know about secure group tags, right? We talked about that. So uh, we talked about SGT, that is nothing but those tags. Uh, security groups are nothing but the groupings which we talked about, right? You group your sales destination servers into say something called as sales. So that's your secure security groups, right? And the tags, the tags are basically the numerical values given to each of the groups, right? Those are pretty straightforward. Uh, but starting with now, let's talk about, like I said, the main crusk of, uh, you know, TrustSec because we understood, we just understood from a layman terms what TrustSec can do, it, do for us, but we need to understand from a very technical perspective, right? So uh, when you talk about that, we need to talk about the operations involved with TrustSec, right? So operations, what are the operations? So the first operation I would call as classification, right? The second one is your propagation. These are standard terms, all right? So I'm not just making them up. These are, you'll find these three terms. And the third one is the enforcement. You'll find these three guys, you know, in any of Cisco's TrustSec documentation, right? Classification, what is classification? Classification is assignment of an SGT to a session. So you have, uh, say you have a PC and you're authenticating, say using .1x, right? Via a switch, you're authenticating. So now when, if the authentication is successful, we can have ICE, you know, deliver a SGT or assign an SGT for this session, right? The SGT could be something like 10, right? Or number like 10 or 20 or whatever it is, right? So classification is nothing but assignment of SGT, all right? Uh, what uh, what are the various ways of doing it? Uh, there are two different ways, actually. So there are two ways. One is your static way of doing it, and the other one is your dynamic way. Right? Static way is nothing but, you know, you can manually go to any of the switch here and you can define. You can say, hey, uh, for, uh, you, you, can, you, can, uh, you can tell the switch, you know, if you get any packet with, say, IP address 10.1.1, right, give it a SGT of, tag that packet with the SGT of say 10, right? You can do that manually, right? Not just IP address, you can do it based on VLAN, you can do it based on port and so on. So that's your static, right? Probably it's gonna involve a lot of configurations in that case, right? Uh, but dynamic, dynamic is my favorite because in dynamic generally what you do is, like I said, you define your SGTs and all of those on your ICE over here and the ICE will dynamically you know, assign those SGTs as the connections come up, like .1x or MAB or WebAuth and stuff like that. So 
you know in static obviously you're gonna have more configurations it's work it's gonna work the same way but it's not gonna have more configurations that's it so what we have done till now so we have classified right so we have we have uh, taken our whole set of clients as the clients are coming into our network as they are getting authenticated we have assigned them various STDs okay not a big deal that's done and we have also talked about you can do it in two ways either static or a dynamic way cool now what's the point of just assigning STDs STDs right you need to have a way to propagate these STDs through your network so that's where the propagation piece comes in just like in the previous step here there are two ways of propagation again right two ways when I say two ways one is your inline propagation right and the other one is your XXP what is inline propagation so in inline propagation think of it this way right so let me just get rid of this love this tool to erase stuff very quickly pretty cool all right so when you talk about inline we are talking about inline you know um, propagation so when you talk about inline propagation you kind of have you need to have uh, generally hardware support right so what I mean by that is um, uh, you know you have a switch over here which is getting some packet which is tagged right or let's say he himself is tagging it so you have switch one here then you have switch two here right and let's say switch one you know is looking at the packet and it is tagging because you know S S S switch one can do it so you need to have some kind of a hardware support here for doing it right and when I talk about propagation it also means that once I tag here right the packet is gonna come here a tagged packet is gonna come right and that's gonna come inside switch two right so if switch two doesn't understand the tag so if, if switch two doesn't have the hardware support to understand the frame right then your your whole uh, you know configuration will go for a toss right because then the switch will drop the packet and your packet is lost so inline tagging is only possible if you know if all the switches along the path they have hardware support to tag the packets right and I have, I've been using the word SGT tagging and all of that but at the end of the day just remember that when a, when a switch is tagging a packet it's basically going to put a numerical number so if this is your payload right it's going to put that tag right we talked about like tag number 10 it's just going to put this tag right so if switch one is having the hardware support and it is putting the tag and it is sending it along this link then switch two also should have the support you know to understand that tag and you know either probably propagate it as is or take some action based on the tag and so on right but switch two should have the hardware support uh, so that it can you know probably tag it or send it forward otherwise you know if switch two doesn't have that support it's going to drop the packet right so inline tagging is basically uh, obviously not all Cisco platform and Cisco switches probably support it you'll have to check the compatibility matrix to fi figure out the ones which does uh, and the other question is you might have is uh, I just told yeah this tag basically goes along with the packet but which field right so in SD access if you think of it this particular tag goes along with the VXLAN header because you have VXLAN over there right so VXLAN header carries the SGT but if you don't uh, you know if you're not operating VXLAN then you can still use SGT but then it would basically go inside a very special field it is called a CMD field it's called Cisco metadata field right you can look it up uh, to understand the whole packet uh, you know header but then uh, just for your reference uh, that is the you know header field into which the SGT value is basically carried so that is why I said you know when you are changing the packet and adding all of this you are, you need to make sure that other switches along the path need to have the support to understand this right all right so let's assume that you don't have it you don't have certain switches along the path to understand you know your SGT tags or they don't have uh, capability to add the tag so that's where the second piece comes into picture which is XXP so X XXP is nothing but SGT exchange protocol right it's a control plane peering protocol use it for you know uh, propagating your SGTs right and this is basically used when you don't when when the switch has no hardware support right to 
tag the packets right so xxp again is nothing but a piece of code which goes inside your software so you know what we are trying to do here is we are trying to give a bypass for those legacy switches which probably do doesn't have you know the hardware tagging support so in that case we are giving this a small software module you know um, to um, to kind of fill up the gaps right and how does this work this is pretty interesting again so tagging packets with you know like i said with the sgt requires hardware support right so imagine you have your network uh, similar to that right let's say you have a uh, i don't know switch or router over here another device here let's say switch by mistake i drew a router it's fine so you're gonna have uh, uh, you know probably the clients sitting behind this guy right now imagine this guy this one doesn't have he has no hardware support right but this one has right and let's say the enforcement probably happens here right and this this one has the hardware support but there is no point of him having hardware support if this guy is dropping your packets right the sgt tagged packets so cisco came up with this new protocol called xxp where xxp protocol right so these two guys can communicate to each other where uh, you know basically your switch one here will tell the other guy that this is my mapping right so i have a user who is connected on 10.1.1 so he is going to ex explicitly communicate that this particular ip address should have a sgt mapping of 10 right so when this information reaches this guy right he is going to use that information to either you know maybe he will probably send that packet upstream to some other device tag it and send it or uh, you know if the enforcement is happening here right it can use that information as well so xxp is kind of like a um, let's it's it's a um, it's a bypass method i would say right uh, or in a simple words uh, we can say that if the devices lack hardware capability to tag packets with sgds then we can use xxp right so that the devices do, can still pass ip address to sgd mappings to a cisco trustsec you know peer device right which has some trust capable hardware to do tagging and so on so uh, this is this is basically for that right hope that's clear let's move on the last part enforcement enforcement is the main piece of our whole discussion why are we doing all this extra work of you know classifying propagating and all of that so that we can do some kind of enforcement and in s4 enforcement we have only one thing which is your SGACL right pretty straightforward you know think of it this way I mean in your uh, current scenario in your ACL you write something like this permit IP then you write uh, you know the host IP over here right then you write your destination IP over here and then you write uh, uh, I mean I'm just giving a very simple ACL but probably you also will have some host port and destination port and so on right but this is how your traditional you know acl is with sg acl think of it as it's going to be this this one and this one is just going to be replaced by the tags right so the sales and finance let's say sales has a tag of 10 finance has a tag of 20 this one is going to be defined or replaced by that so what we are saying is any packet which is tagged which is coming in with a source tag of 10 heading towards a destination which has a tag of 20 we are permitting it right or you can change this and make it deny and so on so but do you understand what we really achieved by doing this we made the whole access control independent of ip addresses what is the significance of this now you can have your host you know or client moving all around your campus or moving all around your enterprise getting whatever IP they want but their SGT which is delivered dynamically say by ICE will still remain the same so if a PC right which is uh, you know which which got an IP address earlier 10.1.1 let's say it did the roaming and it went to some other uh, you know campus maybe it, it uh, you know that particular PC traveled to a different continent and you know it probably went to a different 
campus of that same organization, it got a different IP address. Let's say it got 30.1.1.1. Irrespective of what IP it gets, it is still part of sales. So ICE is still going to give the same tag which is 10 and 10 here. Because of which, the access rules what you have defined using SGACLs will remain intact. You don't have to change those. Right? So that's, that's really a very big thing which you achieve using this. All right, so I'll stop boring you with the lecture and probably jump on to a bit of lab and let's test some of these things which we talked about now, right? So to, uh, the lab remains the same. I mean, the, the topology remains the same, pretty much what we did in the previous one. We have switch one, switch two. I think I added switch two in this one, okay. Uh, but apart from that, you know, pretty much the same. So switch one and switch two, both of them have access to the internet. Probably I can show you guys here, yeah, there you go. So I can ping the internet from each of those guys here. Yep, that's it. And, uh, you know, the ICE and domain controller and all of them are in the 172, 16, 32 range. Um, so that's good. So what we'll do is we'll start, we'll go to my ICE here. Let's probably keep uh, one of this tab open. Okay, so let's probably go down to, okay, let's open live logs, right? I, I really like keeping this up always so let's keep this on one single tab let's keep this on while that loads let's go to my uh, other tab and let's do some settings so first thing is let's go to admin administration let's go to settings and you will find uh, eFast I'll tell you the significance of eFast later in the video but uh, let's continue with that for now so let's go to protocols and eFast Let's go to eFast settings and you've got to have that enabled, right? So that's enabled. Uh, probably let's reduce the name of this, the big names. So let's change it to say ICE, right? That's the authority ID, right? AID, right? We'll start seeing that in the pack. So AID is over here. Let's save that. What else? Um, let's probably go down to uh, TrustSec. So if you go down to TrustSec, you'll basically see a bunch of things it will give you like a quick workflow on how to configure stuff like one two three four five like the various steps uh, i'm not gonna do all of that so i'll just go down to uh, the components i believe right and uh, <clears throat> i really don't want there's a huge list of security groups so i don't want all of them so what i'll do first is um, let me go down to my policy results let me policy sets, I think I went to a wrong place. My bad. So let's go to policy sets. So I'll tell you why I'm doing this, right? So let me go down here. I'm trying to delete all the STDs which I really don't want to use. So for that, you really need to come down to authorization and you will basically find a couple of these guys over here using the BYOD. It just comes by default. So I just don't want to use those. Let me change that to unknown. Let's change this one as well to unknown and this one as well unknown save <clears throat> so that's being saved that's good and once that is saved now I can peacefully go to my uh, trust sec right uh, let's go to components so I'll show you how you can delete uh, the STDs which you don't want right so I really don't want any of these I mean except probably a couple of them which is unknown and trust sec devices rest of them I basically want to delete I'm not going to be using them for now so let's delete them I mean, it's not no harm if you want to reuse use the one which are already given to you here but I like to keep it clean and start from scratch right so keep the on STDs which you really want and uh, delete the ones which you don't want so there you go that's getting deleted next uh, Okay, successfully deleted, deletion of uh, unknown is blocked. Okay, good. Oh, okay, I think one more got deleted as well. Cool, that's fine. So um, let's create a new SGT. Let's keep the unknown. Unknown is always needed because if there is a traffic which is not getting tagged, it gets the unknown SGT which is zero, right? So I'm going to create a new SGT and we are going to call this as, uh, let's say, uh, we are going to say SGT underscore CTS device right so this is the STD which will be given 
to a device or so a network device right HTTPS need not be just given to clients they can be given to network devices as well so I'm creating a new HTT here and that's going to be for my network devices right so that's good it's got a number of two right keep in mind the number or the tag which it has received it's auto generated number so let's keep that next let's go and add our devices I don't think we added any devices in the previous video so we are starting it fresh let's go and add uh, a device basically which is going to be a switch one switch one uh, the IP address of that is going to be 172.16.32.1 uh, let's turn on radius shared key shared secret let's keep it as Cisco there you go I don't have to do anything else here let's go to advanced trust sec settings here and let's enable this so that the device ID you know basically this configuration is needed for the whole CTS credentials and CTS uh, you know exchanges which was going to happening which will happen in a while right so for that so let's turn that on and uh, the password let's go back to using Cisco everywhere that's good is it visible yep that's good uh, let's scroll down and uh, here we are going to enable uh, you know send configuration changes to the device so if there are any changes with the policies and SGTs right we want ICE to send it using change of authorization right so we are enabling that this one will not work for now because we don't have any configs on the switch we'll also enable this because in future if we want our ICE to log into our box and do some uh, you know SGD IP to SGD mapping changes right uh, uh, it can do as well so probably let's say CTS ICE and uh, the password could be Cisco and Cisco that looks good and I think that's good so this section we are not going to use this is mainly used if you're using some kind of a firewall and if it doesn't have mechanism to automatically download the pack we'll talk about pack in a while but uh, in that case you use that so that's good we are done with switch one remember we have another switch so let's add one more switch as well or probably let's park it let's not do switch two for now let's keep only switch one once we're done with the switch what do we do next let's go to um, there should be um, authorization let's see where is that okay let's go to components for now let's go back to uh, okay so let's go to sorry I think I clicked on something else okay let's go to trust sec policy yeah this is the place so like I said um, when a network device connects to you know ICE or connects to the whole um, you know CTS or trust sec domain right it needs to we need some kind of a policy to uh, assign a SGT for the network device as well right you'll understand later once I start explaining that you know on my whiteboard but just for a minute you know remember what we are doing here is we are creating a authorization policy for our network device as well so we basically go down to network device authorization here you have a rule default rule what we'll do is we'll insert a new rule at the top okay sorry let's do insert a rule new row above so we'll call this uh, I don't know NAD right uh, network access device right so we are creating a policy for that um, and the conditions the condition is basically going to be a device type oh, okay I think we did not yet create uh, uh, let's do that first so I think we did not create a network group right I think we just added a network device but we did not create a network group so let's go to uh, let's go to device uh, where is that okay, let's go to administration and network groups network device groups there you go discard okay I forgot to do that I was supposed to do that as soon as I added the device all right so we are here let's um, go and add a new device group here there you go we'll call this as switch right uh, there is no parent group so that should be fine mm, okay so okay all device types there you go So now we have a switch which is good and where is that device which we added just now let's try to add that device to this particular group so let's
let's go here. There should be a way to change that. So that's belonging to switch. Yeah, here you go. See, we'll change this all device types to uh, switch. The drop down not changing. It's a bit slow today. All right, there you go. We'll change this to switch. And let's go and save this. All right, so that's something which I had missed. So let's see if everything is reflecting fine. Uh, we have the device switch and it belongs to, uh, we have switch one and it belongs to switch, cool. Next, so now we can go and uh, play around with the uh, authorization policy which is needed for our trust act. So we will go to, where do we go? Okay, so let's go to my trust act policy here. And we, we really need the device authorization here, right? So there you go. So let's edit it. So we are, the stuff should populate here. I think it's taking a bit of time today. Let me just try to reload this. All right. So let's go down to the right hand side here. Insert a new row above. Right, so let's put this as NDA because it's a policy for that. Let's click on conditions. Let's add a new condition. Let's click on device type and the device type is gonna be equal to switch, right, which we just now created. And the SGT which we are going to assign is the SGT CTS device, right, because we just now created for that one. So let's say done and let's save this. So we created an authorization um, policy for our trust devices. Cool, done, next. So I think we are all good from our, also let's go and check if the, um, what is that? Uh, let's see from our <clears throat> components, let's go to components and let's check if we have our trust servers appearing. Basically our eyes should appear here, right? So let's see if that appears. Trust sec to play servers. Make sure that you know your eyes appears here. Yep, that's good. So we are done with everything from the uh, from from where from the server side or from the eyes side. So now let's go back to my device. Where's my device? Uh, here, right. So switch one. Switch one is the guy whom we are playing with. So we have to do a bunch of configs here. So let's quickly do those. Okay. So to start with, let's. Um, so we are doing, we are working on switch one. So let's, so we have the host name, switch one. The first is you need to put in your CTS credentials. Right, I'll, I'll explain the working of every single, the whole workflow at the end, but let's finish the configurations first, right? And as it becomes very boring just looking at the theory. So the CTS credentials are nothing but um, the credentials which we entered, um, you know, um, on the, uh, when we added the network device, right? We added that switch one was the ID. So you need to be sure that the same ID is used here. So CTS credentials ID password is Cisco, right? What you entered in ICE, you need to use the same one. Next, what else? Let's put a username, um, basically account, because remember we, we added this as well on ICE. You can go back to the video or, uh, you know, kind of go back a few minutes back and you can check that. We added uh, CTS eyes as a user. So we are basically creating a secret Cisco. There you go. That is done. Now we'll do a bit of AAA stuff. AAA new model, right? Pretty straightforward. AAA authentication, right? For authentication, we'll have to enable dot one X here, right? So because, uh, the, the device will have to uh, authenticate with the authentication server, right? To get any SGT policies and SGT tags and so on. So for that, we need .1x, right? So let's do that. And the group is basically, these are all straightforward configurations, nothing new, right? You can uh, check that out, AAA authorization, network. We'll create a new uh, list here. We'll call this as TrustSec and the group is gonna be radius. And the last part is to play accounting and the 
identity default straightforward config start stop basically we want the session to be logged right on ice that's why so i think start stop i missed a command which is group and radius there you go that's done awesome so that's done and uh, next we'll have to configure let me clear the screen a bit we'll have to configure what the uh, change of authorization so for that triple a server sorry triple a i think it is server uh triple a server radius dynamic auth and we'll have to put the client which is 172.16.32.102 server key cisco done uh, what else let's also do uh, some cts configuration right so let's go back <coughs> next we'll do some cts configuration so cts we'll have to define our authorization um, list and we'll have to map it to the list which we defined earlier remember we defined a list called trustsec here we'll use the same list and we'll also probably log cts verbose let's enable that <coughs> right so that we see all cts related tags sorry logs coming in let's we'll have to enable dot one x globally that's done now uh, what else what else so we are done with all of that let's move on to uh, um, i think uh, the only part which is remaining is basically we gotta create the radius server and then sit and watch what happens so let's keep the logs ready over here hope the logs are ready it's still loading interesting <coughs> let me just reload this all right so the logs are good are they yep that's good so let's uh, go about configuring the next part which is the most important part which is radius server ice did we use ice anywhere give me a second let me check yes i think that should still work it is going to use a default list okay so radius server ice address what's the address we're going to use 172 16 32 dot 102 we'll have to give the authorization port uh, did i make a mistake okay, so i think i missed out ipv4 here ipv4 then you give the ip address the auth port is 1812 right the account port accounting port is 1813 and we should be good We'll hit a timeout of, uh, I don't know, maybe two. And we'll retransmit uh, every three probably, yeah. And let's do pack key and put the, you know, secret which we had configured on ice. Pack key, secret, Cisco, there you go. And successfully provision, provisioning has succeeded. Hey, that's good. So we can check that, show CTS packs. There you go, the pack is obtained, right? Uh, <clears throat> for many folks who are asking me what software which I use for these images, it's basically your 15.2 IOL image. I really can't share the images, but uh, I just wanted to show that it works. See, the pack is downloaded. Someone said in the comments that they were not able to download the environment data. So let's see if I have CTS environment data, right? So I'll explain all of this for folks who are probably completely new, might not know what pack is, what environment data is. Give me a minute, I'll explain that. There you go, I'm able to even download the environment data. You can see the two STDs which I retained are visible here. All right, so that was good. So let's quickly go and check what is happening on my, uh, on my, on my ice, right? So if I refresh this, there you go. So we have, um, let's probably get rid of this. So let's just keep on with this. Otherwise it's going to bombard me with a lot of stuff. There you go. So these are the auth requests which we have received. Right? if we quickly have a look at what is happening here, you'll get to know quite a lot, right? So if I would advise you to also, um, you know, when you're trying this lab, just try to go through each of the logs here. But you can see the first one is about pack provisioning, right? This is nothing but the pack was provisioned. This is all part of the EPFAST protocol, which is used. I'll explain that in a minute, but 
just observe that we have that and then um, you know the rest of the stuff you probably this is going to be a request for downloading the CTS environment data I believe there you go the data download has succeeded and uh, you know there will be a few other requests coming into the ice um, for the specific uh, you know uh, if fast request right so um, <clears throat> all right so this is good so we have done what we wanted to do what we did was we we created a trustsec domain we uh, we basically uh, took our device which is switch one and we connected it to ice right network access device and we uh, successfully um, kind of you know, configured CTS on this one so that you know we are now able to get all the SGTs from ICE and play around with it, right? Awesome. So now let's come back to my theory and let me explain what we actually did from a technical perspective. All right. So for folks who know the whole uh, technicalities behind TrustSec can probably forward the video, but uh, for folks who are new to this, just hang on, this is going to be interesting. So you might have seen, you might have seen a lot of new terms, CTS, PAC, uh, environment data and all of that, right? So I'll try to break them down for you. Till now, whatever we spoke about all the classification, propagation, all of that was very theoretical stuff, right? Uh, but the architecture of CTS, how is, how is the architecture? You know, when you talk about architecture, it's a very interesting architecture, right? So what they have done is they have, let's, I, I would break the whole architecture into three pieces. One is the auth piece, the other one is your, you know, whole policy piece, which is SGACLs, right? And the other one is your secure communication piece, right? So this, these are the three pieces which I like to break them down to, authentication and secure communication and SGACLs. Now, SGACL is obviously mandatory, right? Without this, there is no point of even doing trust and SGD because at the end of the day, SGACLs are the ones which are going to do the enforcement. So you can't really get get rid of these. But the authentication piece and the secure communication is kind of like optional. Right, this one and this one is kind of optional. Like if you really want them, you can do. It's very advised to do it because you want to keep your trusted domain as secure as possible. So, but it's you, your, your domain will still work even without that, right? Now, what is that actually? So when you when you start with uh, you know uh, the, these are the three architecture pieces, but think about a network, right? So when you start with a network in your uh, just like what we did now, we had one switch, but um, you know you might have a big enterprise network, right? You might have like a lot of switches like this um, connected to each other and so on, and you probably are gonna have uh, uh, multiple sites and I don't know different buildings and so on. You're gonna have a big enterprise network, right? So you might not always have connectivity to ICE, right? Not every single switch here, right? Everywhere in your network might not have connectivity to ICE, right? So it becomes very important to build what we call as a trustsec domain, right? So in trustsec domain, every single link which is connecting every single devices, right? And which is part of the CTS or trustsec, right? Are are basically part of what we call as a trustsec domain, right? And what we make sure here is we want to make sure that the peer is real, right? We want to make we want to authenticate the peer, right? So we want to have some feature where you know if this guy doesn't have connectivity to ICE, right? He doesn't have connectivity to ICE. He should be able to download those SGACLs or uh, you know um, you know get those SGT mappings and all of them from the guy who has connectivity to ICE, probably from here, right? He should be able to download from here, but if I have to download something, I need to trust this guy, right? Similarly, if there are some SGT changes here, I would want to download it in this direction either, right? I would want to understand and I would want to uh, trust the packets coming from here. I would want to trust the tags which are coming from the other side as well. So, in a trustsec domain, in an ideal trustsec domain, your whole network which is over here, every single link will be authenticated and trusted between every single device so that every single device can you know kind of exchange SGT information uh, without any hassle right in a very secure way so that's your whole trustsec domain now <clears throat> when you're building a trustsec domain from day one right you're not gonna build your whole network day one you're gonna build one one by one so you're generally this is how it works you'll have a ice 
and you will have the first device in our case we had switch one right <coughs> so we basically will first pick a device right and we will call this device as a seed device right and then we will take the seed device and we'll authenticate with ice right we'll do all that stuff which we just now did right all the magic which we did basically it uses nothing but the eep fast protocol right eep i'll just write it down here you can research more on this protocol this is a very big lengthy topic in itself extensible authentication protocol flexible authentication via secure tunnel okay great uh, i thank god i remember that okay it's a huge it's a big protocol but what it does basically is that it is enabling you to authenticate to your eyes right and and basically um, you know kind of like uh, uh, there are a bunch of steps like in even in efast you are basically having phase 0 phase 1 and phase 2 there are three separate phases right and this phase 0 is the phase where you know the pack is downloaded right so pack you saw me uh, doing show CTS pack right pack so what is this pack <clears throat> pack basically stands for protected access credential right it's a unique shared credentials used to kind of mutually authenticate you know in this case obviously the ice and the switch right so it is associated with a specific client username and the ad id remember the ad id which i configured on ice as ice so it is associated with the ad id and the uh, client username right which we configured as well remember we configured this to be switch one remember in that cts credentials command i put in the username so that is basically what is going to be used so pack is like a uh, you know think of it like a very secretive credential which is kind of like um, you know uh, delivered to my switch from the ice during the phase zero of my eep fast protocol right communication happening between here and once i have this pack the switch here will be able to create let me just draw um, you know three different lines to make you understand so there'll be a blue let's say there is green and let's say red so you have phase uh, sorry so this is going to be phase zero then one and two so during phase zero we have the pack key which is getting downloaded during phase one the switch will use the pack key to create what we call as a tunnel a tls tunnel with the ice and during phase two the client will authenticate via the tunnel right why are we doing all this because we just want to make sure that the ice and the switch right they are not some rogue devices we want to make sure that you know the device is talking to the right ice or the ice is talking to the right switch right so we are using the eFast protocol for the authentication piece here okay cool <coughs> so that being said what else so that was all about switch one but and once this happens right once uh, this communication happens now switch one has uh, authenticated to ice and ice will uh, you know uh, provide the SGTs the SGT which have been configured on ice those are downloaded onto my switch and that's why you saw me uh, run the command show CTS environment data to get all the various you know SGT information on my switch good so this is the first device so that's a switch that's a seed which is good so your yeah, next question would be Joel so what about the next set of devices I understand switch got authenticated which is good but what about the rest of the devices so for that let's let me just go back here let me just get rid of this again right so we are, what we have done till now we have ice we have switch one which has authenticated and which has downloaded the uh, you know which uh, SGDs and everything is here right ready ready for the switch to make decisions but obviously in a big network you're not going to have just one device right so the seed device is done the seed device is taken care of but what about the other switch which i have which is switch 2 which is connected to switch 1 <clears throat> what we do is we call this switch as a non seed device why because this guy doesn't seem to have direct connectivity to ice right i mean it is it has to go like this and there's only one link over here right which uh, it has to go through switch 1 it doesn't seem to have a direct connectivity to ice 
so that is one way to figure out which is your seed and non seed if you have if you have connectivity to your eyes right in that case that would become your seed device here what happens is <coughs> in this particular example since i have just one path you have just one link over here right and generally in your trussec domain the links between the switches right you you kind of what you do is you you put some kind of authentication encryption right between these and that is done by using macsec right the mac security protocol right another protocol so uh, imagine trussec is not just one single thing it has a bunch of things happening inside it has epfast it has dot one x and epfast so and uh, between for every single links to be authenticated and secure because i told you all right in a trussec domain every single link will be authenticated and we have to trust every single link so switch one should be able to trust switch two only then it will pass traffic along it right otherwise this link you know it is not going to pass the traffic so for that purpose right we are moving on so we have done with the seed we are moving on to non seed device and in a non why this device is a non seed device because it just has one path right to reach eyes and that path is for now think of it as it is it is down why because it has not been authenticated yet right so this link which you see here between these two guys that is not authenticated so ideally you know there is basically no path no other path to reach the ice right so this becomes the non seed device now what happens is that your your seed device will act as authenticator for your dot one x so what did i just now say we haven't yet authenticated non seed device we really don't know if is the non seed device a rogue device is he some kind of is he you know some kind of a outside device trying to you know uh, be part of our trusted domain right so we need to authenticate it the first protocol which comes to your head when you talk about authentication is dot one x right and dot one x is literally what we are basically going to use to authenticate you know the link over here the max security is an added feature that's that's why i kept on saying uh, here right the secure communication this is where max security comes right and this is where dot one x comes both of these are optional you can really run a trusted domain you can manually you know open up all the links and you know don't you don't have to like do this compulsory but it's advised to do it to keep your trusted domain secure so you run authentication for link authentication you do dot one x and for um, you know max security uh, for basically encryption so that the messages or the data flowing here is encrypted right for that you use max security cool awesome so uh, that being said let's go about i think doing the configuration the next piece of configuration and you'll get to see some fun stuff all right so uh, let's jump on to my switch here what we'll do is so ethernet 1/0 and ethernet 0/0 so let's go to ethernet 1/0 on this guy so what i'll do is interface ethernet 1/0 let's make this as switch mode mode uh, encapsulation sorry uh, let's make this trunk uh, encapsulation dot one q switch uh, mode uh, trunk we have to make this as a trunk link switch port trunk uh, allowed vlans let's enable 1 and 32 right and let's do a no shot <clears throat> and let's see uh, what configuration do we have on this one so we'll have to do show uh, show run section interface okay there is already trunk stuff here good cool so let's do some triple a configurations or before that let's uh, actually give me a second all right so we'll first go to my network devices on ice let's finish up the ice stuff first right let's get that out of our way so let's go and duplicate the device here because we are adding one more device so that device has to be defined on ice so we'll have to change this to switch 2 uh this one goes from 32.1 to 30.2 to rest everything looks good the radius stuff looks same and um, the the what else let's uh, set to default what is this default okay 
that's pretty good um, okay so let's go down here the switch to the id is changed which is good the rest everything looks good so let's go and submit this so now we have two devices here uh duplicated the switch which is good okay so i think that's it from here for now we are good mm, yeah that's good so let's go back to my switch 2 and let's start some configurations here shall we so let's start by putting in our cts client stuff right cts uh, let's clear the screen a bit observe the subtle differences in configurations i'll, I'll try to call them out cts uh, credentials ID switch uh, to password Cisco make sure that the ID is correct whatever you configure on ice right so that's good next what do we do next put in that username CTS ice uh, privilege 15 you're not basically using this now maybe uh, later right let's do a secret instead of password secret cisco looks good this is not really being used now right this is very important because this is the whole username password which will be used in the authentication methods which are going as part of your e-fast right so this is very important make sure that this is correct cool to play i think by now you guys know this part very easily uh, if you want you can like fast forward this because this is pretty much same as what I did the previous one default uh, group radius triple A authorization network and default group radius and the last one is to play accounting right accounting uh, for identity default uh, start stop and group and radius just a bunch of tabs which you keep on pressing to get these commands out so the next is your radius server <coughs> observe uh, I'm, I mean I'm just obviously gonna put the VSA send authentication this is just your attributes vendor specific attributes right but observe that I at no point I will mention the radius server IP address right so that's a very interesting okay so I've done that okay give me a minute let's do the next part which is triple A server uh, uh, did I make a mistake server radius I guess radius dynamic authorization and here I'll obviously I have to put the IP address uh, of the radius but this is you understand the point right here it doesn't make sense because this is only for the incoming COA for radius to do some changes in future that's it but yeah so that's good and do we have to do anything else enable dot one x guys that's important dot one x is used everywhere when you're using trust x so make sure you get that enabled perfect so look at my configuration at no point did i do this one which one i did not do show run let me show you which one which i'm talking about right there you go so this radius server configuration i did not do that i did it on the seed but i did not do it on my switch 2 so the switch 2 really doesn't know the ip address of radius doesn't know the ip address of ice right so keep that in mind for a minute and let's also probably go and enable radius locks here on this guy uh, okay so now the fun stuff starts so what we'll do now is we'll go to this interface which is uh, <coughs> ethernet 1 slash 0 which is the trunk interface right so this is where we are going to do this what we are going to do this part which i kept on saying the authentication and the secure communication part now because we are using our uh, what are we using we are using our uh, IOL images here now this is this might be a bottleneck here this might not really work it will surely work in your physical hardware but let's try you know I'm pretty sure it will not work but I just want to show you guys at least the configurations right so that you can try probably on a hardware but uh, 
yeah so that's good so let's go inside the interface and let's run cts.1x so we are enabling dot one x for authentication purposes right and once we enable dot one x we will have to see the interface goes down for a minute uh, so once you enable dot one x bunch of things so you have to enable this configuration is mainly for your uh, uh, for your for your uh, max sec right so Excuse me. Yeah. So for your Mac sec, you have different options. So you can, if I do a question mark here, you can see there are four options. Either you can do, you can enable encryption and authentication, or you can do only authentication. Right. This is all your Mac sec stuff. I'm just going to do null for now. I really don't want uh, any authentication and encryption. I just want the HTT encapsulation. Right. So I'll enable that. And the most important command: propagate HTT. So I'm basically telling. Whatever HTTPs you get, propagate it to the peer device. Right there you go. So and then I'll do a no shut. So that's the config on my seed device. Now let's come back to my uh, switch two, which is a non-seed. Go to interface Ethernet one slash uh, sorry zero slash zero here. The same interface which is connected to my switch one, right? So I'm basically going to do the same thing here as well, which is CTS dot one x. And uh, let's do what? Let's do SAP, uh, SAP mode, null, and propagate STD. And obviously no shut. All right, there you go. So that's all the configurations we had to do. Okay. And let's observe here. I believe the authentication should start failing. See, I see the dot one x is failing here. Uh, the reason is, I think that's kind of like a limitation of your I/O uh, image, but we will see the pack getting downloaded though. So I think you should have the pack on my switch too. Let's see that. There you go. The pack is downloaded, right? But so this is what I wanted to, you guys to observe, right? On my switch too, I really did not provide any kind of radius or I did not provide any ICE information. I did not put the ICE IP address, but still the pack got downloaded. How did this work, right? So a part of it is working and maybe a part of it is not, right? The part of it which is working is this one. The second part which is supposed to work is basically, um, let me let me just uh, explain that over a sketch. Give me a second. Okay, guys, the last part, let me try to explain that uh, piece which was failing, right? Um, just to recap, what we have, we have the eyes here. We have switch one, which is the uh, seed device, right? And uh, you know the switch one has authenticated himself using the whole you know pack. Pack has been provisioned. Once the pack was there, you know it created a TLS session towards ICE, and uh, uh, you know uh, it um, uh, it then it authenticated as well as a result uh, over that TLS tunnel. So everything is good between these two guys, right? So uh, the seed device is all good. Now what we did, we enter introduced another switch here, which was switch two, and we made this guy as the trunk link, right? And along this trunk link, what we did was we did the CTS dot one X. So when we did that, what happened was we enabled dot one X, you know, for authentication along this link, right? So as soon as you do that, what happens is that both of the switches will try to mutually authenticate each other, right? So if you do a packet trace along this link, you will see that, you know, both of them will be trying to uh, authenticate each other, right? Now, this is not very much preferred because, you know, you are still putting a dependency on the, because when I do CTS.1x, finally, what will happen is this one, this switch will 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 you, will you assume the role of a supplicant, right? So supplicant need not always be a client, right? it need not be, always be a Windows 7 machine, it can be a network device as well. So in this uh, situation, switch 2 will act as a supplicant, whereas switch 1 will act as a authenticator, right, for your dot one x. So now that the roles are assumed, why this is acting as an authenticator? Because it has connectivity twice. Whereas this guy doesn't have a connectivity twice, right? So switch one is taking the role of authenticator, switch two will take the role of a supplicant, right? And the authentication process will start. Uh, switch two will try to authenticate switch one and switch one will try to authenticate switch two. Now, if you look at the packets, what happens is the inner packet, right? Uh, because when this guy is acting as authenticator, the main job is to take the packets coming from the supplicant 
and encapsulate it in a radius packet and send it towards size right that's the main role of a authentication that's how any of your dot one authentication works right you get your eep packets or epol packets right um, uh, you deliver the epol packets to the authenticator and the authenticator will encapsulate those packets and send it uh, to uh, as radius packets towards size for the communication now the same thing happens here but the very interesting thing is the credentials. You might ask me the question, whenever dot one X is there, there should be some username and password credentials. What credentials will be used here? So each of the switches will basically use their CTS credentials itself for the authentication. Remember, for this guy, the credentials are switch two and Cisco, right? Whereas for switch one, the credentials are switch one, SW1 and Cisco. So these credentials itself will be used for the dot one X authentication. So this one will be used in the inner packet, but as soon as the switch encapsulates and sends it out, right, it will put a dummy, uh, you know, uh, username outside. I think it is CTS dash client, right? That will be the username which will be put, uh, you know, uh, in the radius packet. So this will be the inner credentials, and the outer credentials will be something like CTS client, and uh, that will be sent towards ICE, right? ICE already has those credentials. Remember, we have defined both of these over there, so ICE will be able to now. Uh, you know authenticate both the both of these guys right so once uh, both the both the switches are authenticated then the whole maxsec process kicks in right because now you would have defined using that sap mode command remember we defined some uh, we, we put it as null but you can put some kind of encryption and uh, you can do some uh, maxsec authentication and encryption over there so so that you know from now on all the data which is communicated along this link is encrypted and you know authenticated right so for that you could uh, do that maxsec which is obviously a uh, you know optional right similar to how this is optional now like i said not many people or not many networks might prefer this dot one x over here because you are putting a dependency on ice so if your ice goes down then you know this whole link will fail this whole link will not trans uh, you know, until the link is authenticated, no traffic will be passing, except the whole, you know, e packets. Other than that, no traffic will pass. So that is the reason why people generally, sometimes, uh, most of the time, you see configurations. People don't use CTS dot one x; they use something as CTS manual. So when you use CTS manual, what happens is you are manually, you know, putting some kind of a um, uh, uh, authentication check here, right? You you put CTS manual, and you can define your peer identity. You can say you know, I want to authenticate switch two, and on switch two, I can say I want to authenticate switch one. So manually, you uh, you'll have to configure it statically on the devices, and you'll be forcing this link to be authenticated. Well, it's not very secure, but uh, kind of uh, when you think about resilience in your network, maybe a good way to go because you are removing the dependency from ICE. Right. So hope that was clear. Just to recap, um, what we uh, did was, um, I mean. Uh, SG, uh, TrustSec, we talked about TrustSec, why we need it, and we talked about the three important pillars or operations, classification, um, we talked about propagation, we talk, talked about enforcement. Um, classification is mainly, uh, I did not want to spend much time uh, with respect to these three operations because you find ton of resources online on that. Uh, how do you classify, how do you do dot one x, how do you do map, that's like very common, you find a lot of resources online. How do you propagate using SG, uh, XXP, that is exchange protocol, again for that you will find a lot of people doing it. Uh, the last part is enforcements. Enforcements, I have kind of already covered it, much of it in the SD access videos where you know you can define SG group based policies, drag and drop and you can select what to permit, what to deny, right? it's pretty straightforward. Uh, next is I wanted to concentrate much on the architecture piece here, uh, when we talk about architecture and how we can make H, uh, TrustSec very secure. right? So that is where I wanted to touch upon, uh, again, SGACL is one piece of the architecture, which, like I said, is already covered a lot. So I do not want to do, redo on this piece, whereas I wanted to cover much on authentication and secure communication. Now, like I said, for authentication, the very important piece is just to bring in, um, you know, uh, the, and maybe if I have not mentioned, this whole process of, um, you know, having switch one, authenticate switch two, we call that as NDAC. Right? So that process itself is called uh, uh, network device admission control, if I'm not wrong. Right? So because you have switch one, you know, uh, uh, playing the role of admitting switch two into the TrustSec domain. Right? So that is why it's called as NDAC. Anyway, so what we did here was we configured ICE first, then we configured switch one. Um, we uh, made sure that switch one got the PAC key 
using the PAC key switch one will try to contact back to ICE using a TLS tunnel and on that TLS tunnel you know it will try to authenticate as well right because we have put those C uh, CTS credentials so it will try to authenticate once uh, both of them uh, have authenticated you know the trust is uh, uh, achieved and uh, you know the uh, the uh, SGT information will kind of be downloaded on switch one and if you keep on refreshing the uh, environment data right you basically get to see the uh, SGT mappings getting downloaded uh, if there are some SGT policies SGACLs those also will get uh, downloaded on switch one so that is all about that is um, how the seed device plays but the very interesting thing is how you can bring in a non seed device like if a device you have a device in your network which um, doesn't have connectivity to ICE, then how would that device kind of like, you know, um, uh, co connect to the TrustSec domain, right? So that was very interesting to see here. What we did was we, con we converted this link to trunk, right? And we enabled CTS.1x along this link, right? So when you did that, uh, what happens is, uh, you know, your switch one plays the role of authenticator and uh, your switch two takes the role of a supplicant, just like a normal .1x, right? And uh, the dot one x basically dot one x is nothing but your EAP packets, right? So the switch two and switch one will mutually try to send each other the EAP packets, right? At the end of the day, switch one is the authenticator. So both of these packets coming from both of these places are then encapsulated and sent towards my ICE as radius packets, right? My ICE will authenticate the link because ICE has the uh, you know. Um, username passwords configured right for both of these guys switch one and switch two so ice will see that yeah these are credible um, you know um, these are credi credible uh, requests right radius requests coming in so it will reply back with the uh, access uh, accept right so it will basically uh, enable or it will um, reply back to switch one saying that yes this link is now authenticated it is uh, coming from the right people so dot one x link uh, is authenticated and then if you want, you, uh, I mean, we, we configured a command called SAP mode. So using that command, you can now enable uh, Mac security as well. So that now the traffic which is flowing along this link, it is not just from an authentic authentication perspective, it is also secure, it is encrypted, right? Mac security brings in the whole encryption uh, concept. So both of these guys will start negotiating some kind of a key and both of them will encrypt the data using that and uh, now everything will get encrypted, right? So now you have end to end, you know, though um, uh, earlier switch to did not have connectivity or did not have connectivity along this link because this link was kind of down, right? Because until CTS.1x is enabled or this is authenticated, the link will be down. But now once everything is completed, switch two will be able to tag the traffic, right? With the SGT and it will be able to send the traffic along this link towards, uh, you know, uh, rest of the network. So that's what I wanted to cover in this. Uh, maybe I'll use SGT uh, or TrustSec in few, some of my other videos coming um, you know, in the near future, maybe in dot one x and map videos. Uh, but hope uh, that was, uh, this is probably a little bit of an advanced uh, section of TrustSec, but hope that was useful. Thanks a lot for watching and uh, have a good day.